Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up later in the show, we'll visit the Northwest Angle in Minnesota, famous for its walleye fishing. But first, Madeline got a chance to sit down with our guest for this week. And my guest is Scotty Nolan, a friend of mine who is the president of the newly formed North Dakota Film Society. Scotty, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so this is exciting. Of course, you invited me to join uh, the Film Society a year ago. We got to vote on all kinds of awards. But first off, uh, tell folks a bit about yourself, your background. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm born and raised in Atlanta. Um, shortly after college, uh, I was kind of getting my feet wet there in the kind of television and film scene. Um, I also do marketing is kind of my profession. Um, but I find I found a way for those worlds to kind of collide and that's taken me to LA for a bit and then uh, I decided to adventure somewhere brand new and came to Fargo, North Dakota. Great. Um, which is a little bit different than those places, but it's been, uh, it's been a wild ride. Good. And what gave you the idea to start the North Dakota Film Society? Yeah, so once I got here, well, I'll back up. In, in Atlanta, I had been doing some writing um, while working in the industry, also doing uh, my own everything from uh, film criticism to writing for some different online journals and uh, joined the Georgia Film Critics Association, of which I'm still a voting and participating member. Um, and then once I got to California and kind of found my my click there, I, I knew that once I was making Fargo home, I, I wanted to kind of find uh, a similar network of people. I knew it had to be here, even though a lot of people probably think North Dakota, you know, this is kind of a flyover state. Um, but I, I felt like that audience had to be here, especially with the film festival mm -hmm. um, and those things. And so as I was trying to kind of plant my feet uh, and find those people, that's when I started looking for something like this and couldn't quite find uh, what I was looking for as far as that group. And uh, so I just took my own advice. I feel like I would typically give someone else and decided to create what I couldn't find. And it's been incredible. I've gotten to meet people like you, um, a lot of our colleagues Craig now. Carlson, yeah, right, it's, it's yeah. been fantastic. Well, I'm glad you did. Uh, just recap kind of that first year uh, we got to vote like we were real, you know, yeah, LA film critic type people. And exactly, and, well, uh, and that's been one of the what was our winning film and things like that, and how did it go? Yeah, one of the uh, one of the things I've enjoyed about being part of these kind of groups uh, is how they play into the conversation, especially with awards. I know you're an awards guy, especially Oscars, uh, and I am too. It's been you know something I've loved since I was a kid. And being part of that conversation and helping kind of build the buzz for certain performances or movies, uh, it's really neat to be part of that. And that was another thing I kind of found throughout my um, kind of writing career is there are definitely groups that are that get a lot of the press and they're known and almost every state and city seems to kind of have its uh, kind of voice in there. And I wasn't finding that kind of group here. So I felt like, again, let's create that group. Let's make sure North Dakota is part of that conversation. And it turned out great. We threw it together really, really quickly as we started kind of getting our group together. And uh, we we joined in. We gave Parasite our best mm -hmm. picture win. It was close, though, right? Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it I was think really, that was really my close, vote. Yeah. It was real close, yeah. Yeah, and we got some really uh, kind of vast uh, answers from people, uh, which was really fun to see because typically I think some of the groups, you tend to get people who are trying to predict the Oscars in their votes. And I think we had a really good kind of conversation going with the choices people were making as far as what they felt like was the best of the year. Uh, but it was also great to see that we, you know, gave our prize to Parasite just a few months before yeah. it went, you know, took the Oscar. So, yeah. And we also gave um, a prize to Honeyland, mm -hmm. not only for documentary, but for cinematography. And we were the first voting body in the entire world to give that movie any kind of notice. And it went on to get those same uh, nominations at the Oscars. Yeah. And I'll plug myself. I think I was the only person to nominate the actress who played the sister in Parasite. She was so good for supporting oh, yeah. actress. You even credited with me. Oh, that's a good choice. Yeah, you know, it was a good choice. I think that's one of those movie. movies because there's no Hollywood recognizable know, name. Right. It's easy to overlook. But yeah, that's okay. what's fun though with, with with these kind of groups to get those different kind of perspectives yep. of what people are seeing. Okay, let's talk COVID. This has been devastating to the <laughs> movie and TV industry. Can you kind of just You've got your finger on the pulse of this. Can you talk about job loss, production shutdown, uh, no product to show in the theaters? It's like a domino, isn't it? It really has been, yeah. And not only are we seeing that now and what we have to watch, and we're kind of, it's definitely changing the trajectory of the industry. We're seeing how um, people like Netflix are coming in and swooping in and grabbing some of these titles that were supposed to have already released, and they're starting to throw them out on their services. So they still make some sort of profit for the studio. Um, we're getting this weird domino effect of studios holding 
releases. Disney still is trying to figure out what to do with some of their titles. Like Mulan. Exactly, Mulan. Right, right now, I think yesterday they, they announced that Soul uh, may end up on the streaming exactly. service, right. which has been this anticipated animated title. Um, so, yeah, it's been interesting to see how the studios have scrambled, but I think what we haven't quite seen yet is how this is going to affect new content we get in the future. You know, they're just now starting to film certain things. I think things that we probably are anticipating are still going to be on hold for a while, and it, we're, we're going we're to feel the effects for a couple years, I think. I think the impact, Scotty, is going to be felt more for the 2021 releases. Yeah, because 100%. you know the Oscars did extend the 2020 eligibility through February, but if there is nothing being yeah. shot, I wonder about the 21 Oscars. That could be a very weak year. Exactly. Year. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. I think also as consumers and audience members, yeah, we're going to continue seeing that change. You know, right now we're lucky that none of our theaters here in Fargo have had to shut down. No. Oh, they shut down, but they haven't had to close permanently. Um, but who knows what happens if, if the box office numbers continue to, to dwindle, you know, every, every weekend since they've reopened has not been the knockout that they've been hoping for. No, not yet. And Tenet, Tenet has underperformed also. Um, uh, so the TV fall season, this is usually a big deal for people. Yeah. Is there no season? Can you kind of update us on what's going on? Yeah, that's another one where we are starting to see networks figure out ways to film especially reality shows, you know, they can throw people in a house, you know, call it a bubble and try to get something out. Uh, but I think we're going to, I think it's going to kind of be that domino effect again, like we did with, we saw with, we'd see with movies and those seasons are going to continue to either get pushed back. We've started to see shows that weren't done yet that studios are just realizing we can't afford to linger and keep everybody on board. We've got to just say it's over and put our efforts somewhere else and but things like Chicago Fire that people watch, you know, those those aren't being filmed, are they? I don't think they're so. Not, I don't think so. And a lot of those, uh, their their crews and their cast, especially with that, they are Canadian based. A lot mm -hmm. of them, some of those shows film in Canada, uh, like Riverdale. They have put their cast and crew kind of in a bubble up there to keep going. Um, but they they either have to find a unique way to do it, or they've got to yeah realize we just can't do it right now. And if it's worth holding on to, great. If it's not, then we got to shift efforts, which again is going to come down to the quality of the stuff that we're getting as consumers, um, and then you know, how risky our studio is going to feel giving these artists the the flexibility to keep making stuff. So, in terms of production, is this an opportunity for Canada? Because we know the COVID cases up there are yeah. minimal. New Zealand, I know there's been some shooting there. Is that where the productions are being filmed right now? I think you mentioned so. I Riverdale. Think, yeah. I think it might be. I think there's still, you know, some of the travel advisories. Obviously, there have yeah. been people who have been able to figure out how to work their way around <laughs> those things. Uh, I, I definitely think they're probably going to see a, a positive impact. And I, I wonder how it's going to change things like uh, Hollywood's already been kind of figuring out how to still be the, the king of filming. And then you have places like Atlanta and Louisiana you know, they nothing going on. Yeah, there. There's nothing going on, even though they've been forking over so much money to build new studios in those places and and make it available with their tax cuts. But, you know, the virus definitely doesn't yeah. care about that. Do you have friends in L.A. and Atlanta that were working solidly in, in the industry? And what are they doing now? Is this must be devastating? Yeah. So um, a lot of the crew based people that I know, they are finding similar work in trades that they know, whether that's carpentry, things like that. Um, that can fill those spaces. Uh, luckily, some of those, uh, uh, in, uh, especially in Georgia, they have some uh, uh, incentives with unemployment that people are taking advantage of. Uh, in LA, it's a lot of people doing a lot of Zoom stuff, a lot of um, you know script reading virtually, those kinds of things. Anything they can figure out what to do, and then some. Yeah, they're you know Uber driving and stuff, whatever they can <laughs> do to kind of make it work. Um, you know, we talked about this Oscar season, and we can't assume everyone follows this like you and I do. So can you explain what the Academy decided for the films released in 2020 and how this is gonna work? Yeah, so and, and streaming being eligible. Exactly, yeah, so typically they will, um, they, a film must release in theaters in LA, uh, in LA County for at least a week in the calendar year. This year they realized that's gonna be really, really difficult, so any film that was expected to get a theatrical theatrical release. If it got a streaming release, it'll still be uh, viable. It can still count towards the Oscars. And then they've extended the window into next year, which has never happened before. Never. No. Uh, so some of these movies that 
you know, the French Dispatch and movies like that that we've been anticipating to be Oscar titles that right now have been taken completely off the schedule could still show up, you know, in January or February and get that kind of release that that makes them eligible. And uh, so this may also be the first time we see movies that are only on Netflix make it into the Oscar race. Yeah, films like The Truth. I know Catherine Deneuve's gotten some yeah. some buzz there. So the awards won't be till April, right, Scotty? Correct. Yep. Okay. So the next year. Again, we don't know what's going to happen with COVID, but presumably March through December, there'd only be 10 months of eligibility for the 21 Oscars. Is that your understanding? That is my understanding. I'm interested to see if they look and see if there are films that were already slated to be released next year, if that will still count, if the eligibility, you know, if they try to finagle those rules to make it where if a film was already a 2021 release, let's make it, you know, available for 2021. But I know you're going to get people who are going to, they're going to compare those movies and you're going to get movies that are going to get lost in the conversation. So this is definitely going to be a year where they, you know, someone's not going to be happy at the end of it, but, uh, but I'm glad that they at least extended it to help us figure out kind of what we're going to be watching. And I know you like seeing movies at the theaters. I do too. And I do want to see some of these on the big screen, you know. Well, nobody's going right now. I can assure yeah. you I have, I have reviewed four films in the theater and I think the grand total of other people in the theater has has told like 10 in four four trips to the theater for yeah. me so it's there's nobody there and as we said tenant is underperforming might be because i didn't care for the movie that much but here's the big question scotty have people gotten used to watching movies in their home during covid and will that impact the long term uh, health of theaters. In other words, is the theater experience still going to be great for a film like a Bond film or Marvel? Or is this a bad trend for Hollywood because so many people were sitting in their houses and apartments for six months? Yeah, that's a really, that's going to be a really tough thing to kind of to gauge. I think everyone was looking at Tenet and Mulan to be those movies that would help us figure that out. And uh, I think once Disney released Mulan and, you know, they haven't released their numbers yet on how many people watched it, but the word on the street is that they had enough people watch it and it released in theaters internationally that they're going to be okay. Um, I think we'll, I think maybe people are going to start realizing that if they can access those big movies from their couch, that is a way more comfortable and cheaper mm -hmm. experience for them in the long run. Uh, I'm hoping that maybe this will give places like the Fargo Theater, these art house cinemas, a little bit of an edge where if someone's going to leave their homes to go see a movie, um, it's going to be something interesting that makes it feel worth, you know, spending that money and maybe not just the the latest, greatest, you know, big budget movie. Obviously, the studio would rather it be the other way around. But I am hoping that this, yeah, gives our art house cinemas a boost. Yeah, uh, whenever the Fargo Theater <laughs> opens, right? Uh, so what theater chains have you heard that are in trouble? I've heard AMC is really struggling. Marcus has reopened, but what are you hearing out there? Yeah, AMC definitely has gotten the big kind of news buzz with that. With that, um, I think Regal is trying to figure out some unique things to do to keep going, and those are the, kind of the two big ones across the country. Um, but I think the the more creative people are these kind of smaller uh, smaller theater chains like Marcus that they you know have been clinging on. I know he, uh, Greg Marcus, released a statement recently saying that they did unfortunately have to cut some people mm -hmm. um, throughout the company, which is not what they wanted to do, but they, they also are scrambling to try to figure out how do, we, how do we keep this going and how do we preserve the experience, which is an important part of, of movies, you know. Mm -hmm. Now here's an interesting question too. So Nolan was really, Christopher Nolan, the director, people don't know who we're talking about, who did Inception and Dunkirk, he was really the first to wait. He wanted Tenet in a theater. Yeah. And you know, so far, I think it did 20 million on the Labor Day opening, which isn't bad under COVID, but then the word of mouth, I think it dropped the second weekend. But a film like Unhinged, which isn't very good, I think actually sort of got a boost being in theaters, because I think it would have got lost mm -hmm. if there were other films out there. Is that, what, what's your theory on that? I agree with that, yeah. I think uh, you definitely have people out there hungry, hungry to go to the movies. They want something new. I think that's why we didn't see a huge rush of people to see things, even though the classic movies were starting to come out, um, they weren't rushing to that because they could also, you know, watch Jaws on, at home. They could rinse it off Prime, you know, or something. They don't have to go to the movies. So once they started getting new original content, I think that was driving some people out. Um, we also haven't seen theaters open in the biggest markets. Right. You know, New York, LA, and San Francisco, they're still closed. So that definitely affects the box office. But uh, yeah, I think we, I think we're seeing 
some of those movies, like you said, that would be lost get a little bit of attention. But I don't know that unhinged box office numbers would have been, you know, that bigger or that smaller. It's just had, getting more publicity because it was the yeah, first one. And it right. seems like a lot of money compared to what else is out there. Right. But, you know, if it had released in a typical year and made the same amount of money, we would have called it a flop, you know. Right. Crystal Ball, we have the James Bond film in November, Black Widow's coming, um, some other big ones. Is the success of those films going to depend more on COVID numbers or will people just say, I want to see that Bond film? And then we're also dealing with limited seating capacity by the theaters. Yeah. So it's really a, a three prong thing, isn't it? It is. And we've kind of trained audiences as much as people like to say that they don't like to listen to critics or, or those things. We've kind of trained the consumer to look at reviews, look at Rotten Tomatoes, things like that. And, you know, it does get we, they get press whenever they have a really big opening weekend. And no matter under the COVID umbrella or not, when a movie only makes $20 million, but we know it's a big budget Christopher Nolan film, that looks you know like a flop and it doesn't make you want to rush out to see it. Because if everyone else in the world hasn't rushed out to see it, like Titanic or something, it's not an event movie anymore. You know? And so I think uh, between COVID and I think, you know, I think that definitely plays into it, but I think we also, we train people to want to be part of making history but we haven't given them a reason yet to be part of that history. Mm -hmm. This has been devastating on film yeah. festivals. I, I, I told people if, if we'd have had the film festival in Fargo a week earlier, we'd have got it in, but who knew? Yeah. But it's all virtual now. Um, what financial impact is that having on film festivals? I think the biggest impact is how it's impacting the cities they're in. Um, the tourism dollars definitely, you know, how that impacts far the Fargo theater here in Fargo. Uh, I know that's kind of their big, uh, fundraising event every year. Um, those definitely have impacts on the communities that the festivals take place in, uh, but it also impacts how many people can see some of these things, um, which may impact in, in the positive as festivals start figuring out how to run. Uh, right now, we're right in the middle of the Toronto Film Festival, and they have increased the number of press that have been able to view films, um, industry insiders. Uh, they have been selling the films like hotcakes to streaming services and to other distributors. And so that may help out these filmmakers that more eyes are getting to see them, but it's also inhibiting the experience of seeing what one of these movies might play to a packed house and audience. You know, that definitely impacts to what, what the movie kind of looks like for the future. So would you say recapping the winners of this industry and in, during COVID are really Netflix, Disney Plus, and, and Prime Video, places like that, right? They're the winners. Yeah, I would definitely call Netflix uh, probably the biggest winner yeah. so far. They they already were kind of ahead of the game of figuring out how to release a new movie. They It took them a few years to, to learn how to do it the right way that, that made the most sense. But I think because of the model they had built, that's where they were easy, they easily kind of swept in and grabbed some of those movies that were supposed to hit theaters that didn't, release them, and, uh, and yeah, they're coming. I mean, they, they've already walked away from the Toronto Film Festival with three or four big, big ticket items. Mm -hmm. So here's an interesting question. I, when I went to these movies, I said in my review, I feel safer in that theater than going to Walmart. But psychologically, the public doesn't see it that way at this point, do they? Because one's essential and one isn't. Is that, is that a fair statement, you think? I think it's fair. A friend of mine, a, a critic in Atlanta, he went to go see Tenet and he said that he's, he's very COVID conscious mm -hmm. and he said that he was distracted the whole time because there were definitely, there were only a few other people in the theater and there were a couple in there who were definitely taking advantage of the eating and drinking yeah. to not wear their masks. And for him, it was distracting, which distracted him from a movie that's already hard to follow. And uh, he said, it's just little things like that, um, that kind of took away from the experience of being back in that theater. Yeah, and they don't police it very well. But luckily when I was in the theater, people were way far away from me, so that was good. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of them did not have their masks on. If people want more information about the impact on the film and TV industry, what's a good website or places to go? The, the king of that kind of stuff is variety. They, mm -hmm. they are always on top of everything kind of bubbling in the industry. We try to share as much of that as we can. We, we have a, a, day, a weekday e-newsletter that goes out from the Film Society, and we try to collect as many of those stories as we can. Uh, so if you go to our website, we, you can sign up okay. for that. And we, we try to um, pick from some of the different outlets and try to get it all out there, yeah. Okay, thanks, Scotty, for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Stay tuned for more. The Lake of the Woods is famous for its walleye fishing. The taste of that clean, sweet whitefish is unparalleled when prepared correctly. Watch our friend, Angle Andy, 
teach us how to prepare our very own shore lunch. Right there, now drop your rod tip down, find the bottom, and this, give it little shakes like this. So you just lightly swim in the minnow. There you got one. Okay, so today I'm gonna to show you uh, how to clean a walleye. The first thing I like to do when cleaning a walleye here is, is uh, you lift these two fins back and you simply angle your knife so it's not going through the scales. You're going back, back into them like so and you go right down to the, the bone here. Our next step is push straight through right down the backbone so I miss this fin, this fin here and this fin here. It'll be flat right, right to here and then I'm gonna stop and flip the flay down. And you simply just take your knife all the way down to the end of the fish, and I prefer not to cut the end off. Some people like to cut it off. The next step is to just skin them. You simply just take your knife, and you just, you just take your knife and push it through the fish like this. All fish cleaning is just push your knife through. Just let your knife do the work. So I'm right down on the skin, and I just slide her right through. There's the rib bones here and there's a set of Y bones. And to, I'm gonna show you how to take them both out at the same time. So what I'm gonna do is, you see the fish has got a, a center line here. I'm gonna be on the rib side and I'm just gonna score my knife right down to the bones. And, and I simply just go right down the ladder line of the fish and I, I'm just laying my knife in there and I simply turn it and go down. And it'll take me a couple swipes here. Just, twist like that and then I go right down the other side of the lateral line take that off and here's your boneless piece of meat here's your ribs you can see there's no meat on there and here's your little strip of Y bones all out at one time and now you got a boneless piece of meat and you simply to get them in strips you simply just cut them like that it's ready to go no bones now we're on to the other side. Same as the other side, we're gonna angle our knife in like this so we're not going down on the scales. We're going back up into them. And this helps you get more meat too as well. Now I'm right at the, the backbone. And then it's simply turn your knife and follow it, the angle of the fish all the way down through right to there's your spot. So we simply just right to the end of the spot there. And then we're gonna flip them open. And then this, this step here is lay your knife and push through. So you get my knife down to the skin here, and then it's simply just slide her through. I'm gonna be on the rib side, and I, I just simply take my knife and cut down to the ribs. So th that's what I'm doing right there. And now I just lay my knife and twist it like, like this. And I'm just following the bones. And then here's the other, here's the line of the fish here. We're gonna go right on that side. And that's gonna, that's gonna take the ribs and the Y bones out at the same time here. And we simply just rip her in half and it's boneless, ready for the frying pan. And there's a hidden golden nugget on these fish as well. This is called the wingding. And now we're gonna show you, it's like the shrimp a lake of the woods. I'm gonna show you guys how to take this out and make it a tasty little, little piece. So I simply just take my knife here, cut it down, and now I got it laying flat. And now I'm gonna cut this, skin this piece of skin off. So I simply just cut it off just like so. And now you got a tasty little, it's like eating shrimp out of lake of the woods. They're pretty much all cleaned up, ready to go now. White as can be. Today we're gonna go the route of shore lunch. We're gonna cook some spuds up. We'll whip a little batter up and put our eight ounces in, six, seven, eight. We'll throw our fish in there. 
So I got my fish batter all mixed up here. We're gonna go outside and do some cooking now. All right, we're gonna fire this bad boy up. It's done probably two, probably five or six shore lunches in the day. I hope you guys are hungry because then you're probably gonna have leftovers. Okay, now I'm down to the shrimp of the lake here. They're going in. They're all fried up, now it's pretty much uh, ready to go. So we got potatoes, fish, beans, about all the essential things for shore lunch. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Post this week. As always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.